Thank you. Now we are going to have our first panel entitled Reinspiring, Reimagining, and Rebuilding Strategies for Sustainable Travel Recovery. Now this discussion will examine various government recovery and sustainability strategies and their immediate needs as they adapt to shifting travel behavior and low consumer confidence in the post-pandemic world. Now I please invite Anita again on stage for this. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, the discussions continue and the fireside chat widens to our now ministerial dialogue itself. As has been discussed, we're in an incredibly time for re-engineering, rethinking, reimagining, and re-inspiring our global industry. Our global industry is one that we know has been a force for good, and it will be a force for good again. But what it needs to be first is a force of hope. So with that, we're going to have our leadership discussion, starting with a gentleman I'm going to welcome back into his hot seat, Mr. Rocky Phillips, the Chief Executive Officer of the Ras Al Khaimah Tourism Development Authority. Rocky, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Sri Arvind Singh, the Honorable Secretary of Tourism of the Government of Industry of India. I beg your pardon. Also joining from the Maldives, we have Dr. Abdullah Masoom, the Minister of Tourism of the Maldives. We're delighted to have us with us as well, Florian Sengshvit, the C CEO of Azerbaijan Tourism, please. The absolutely gorgeous Liz Ortegrera, please, the CEO of Pata. And we have as well Mitsuki Horshino, the Vice Ch Commissioner of Japan Tourism Agency. And we have joining us virtually in about five minutes time, a very special guest who will be joining us representing two entities, both beautiful, wonderful Indonesia, as well as the G20. So we're delighted to have him joining in five minutes time, but we're going to spend the first five minutes talking to our lovely panel. Excellent, thank you very much. So, ladies and gentlemen, this is actually feeling a little bit like a, a continuation as we had the blessing of having the leadership forum this morning where we had some great dialogue. I will not ask you all to do a little performance to our new theme song for Pata's leadership forum, but I'd like to ask you all, we are in a time of remarkable opportunity and remarkable growth because of one primary element that's come out of the last two and a half years. There's a remarkable new understanding about the value and the values of travel beyond the travel and tourism industry. I'd love to understand from your perspectives, how can we tap into that heartbeat now and really make the most of it? And I'm going to start with you, please, Honorable Secretary. Well, if you, you know, one thing that we discussed also in the morning, was that uh, the two years brought out the importance of the recovery of tourism and its impact on the local economies, its impact on businesses, and its impact on especially small and medium enterprises, and its impact on the community. And that, uh, you know, really galvanized uh, local governments, in, in the case of India, the state governments, and the national government all into action because the pain that uh, the pandemic imposed on the sector was something that could not be, you know, just wished away or looked away. And serious steps had to be taken to mitigate the impact. And that brought a kind of a whole of government approach. And we saw that uh, in, in terms of prioritizing vaccination in the country. And when we went on, we had a very big uh, vaccination program because the numbers were very large in India. So the tourism and say, you know, hospitality workers were prioritized and, you know, vaccinated on priority. That helped restore confidence and when you know we opened up travel uh, the the uh, you know the confidence of travelers went up because when they went to a destination the pandemic was not uh, they had no you know scare of catching the disease similarly you know this uh, the aviation industry that had to be brought back on track 
uh, many other sectors which were shut down in the lockdown, the road transport and others. So there was a concerted action from all individuals because of the enormity of the impact of the sector in our country. But I love what you're saying about the vaccines as well. It was because of tourism, I am safer and my family is safer. That's a very interesting point. Honorable Minister of Tourism from the Maldives, from your perspective, how do we leverage this awareness that now exists? Yeah, thank you very much. I bring uh, love and greetings from the Maldives. Yeah, for the Maldives, uh, tourism is our lifeblood. So we have to continue tourism and the pandemic was a, a great uh, challenge, great experience, a great learning. So from that, now we are moving on. We knew that uh, together we can. Also, we understood the importance of international collaboration. Also, we understood the importance of international organizations, particularly like uh, when we give a message to the industry on safety standards, they perhaps don't believe, but when we quote World Health Organization, that's good. When we say WTTC's uh, safety, that helps. When we give uh, partners recommendations, they believe. So now as a destination, I think uh, we have to anchor on making sure that whenever there are bumps, we still sail through. We are going to see more perhaps but we should be ready. So we are working on making sure that we have a multitude of markets. So even one market got get affected. Still the numbers continue because for countries like Maldives, whose main economy depends on tourism, we have to do that. Then of course, there is the international relations, international collaboration, the safety, security of a tourists plus our staff plus the public was the main main theme so for that at that time how do we get the safety we needed the vaccine and when we got the vaccine whom we prioritize our government took the approach of putting tourism employees at the forefront of the queue so that tourists also will be safe this the tourism is a major economic activity now and uh, Maldives is planning so that its benefits get to the people. And uh, we have got a major initiative to take tourism to the local islands so that all the locals benefit through the industry. Thank you. I, I like what you're saying as well from the point of view of the people of the Maldives have always known the importance of tourism. They've heard it, they've heard it, they've heard it, they've heard it. Ooh, now they've felt it. That's the big difference. I think we've been saying it for a long time. Now people have really, now I understand. And so I want to actually ask to Hoshino-san, from your perspective as well, is that Japan has been in a unique position where you've actually had a strong destination to begin with. You went through the closure and we saw with the announcement, which I thought was fascinating, that Japan announced on the UN General Assembly stage that it was reopening and the surge of searches and bookings that took place immediately. How do we, made to make, how do we make, ensure that the people of Japan never forget why tourism is so important beyond the bookings? Yeah, actually, the, uh, the, these two and a half years, uh, Japanese uh, uh, tourism industry suffered a lot. So we Japanese government uh, did the, uh, 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 mainly two things. The one is the, uh, the help the, uh, them to uh, renovate and uh, investment uh, uh, for the future demand, and then the uh, also the, uh, the we uh, promote the domestic uh, uh, st stimulating the domestic demand as well. And then uh, and Anita, as, as, I, as, I, as you told us, the uh, just the, uh, two weeks ago we just opened the, the border, and then the uh, Japan uh, yeah, welcomes the. Uh, uh, the people, uh, foreign people, and then without the, uh, the you know, actually the, uh, you know, back to the pre-COVID pre situation. So the, uh, uh, the so we, as, I, as I told you that we have the, uh, the prepared a lot to welcome the foreign people, and then the, uh, we prepared a lot of the uh, uh, tourism resources which uh, suits the, uh, the current needs of the tourists right now. So the, uh, we are hoping that the, uh, 
uh, in near future, so we are going, going back to yeah, the pre-COVID uh, level. And also, actually, uh, using this opportunity, I would like to announce that the, the last week, we Japanese government announced that the, the, for the UA people, uh, we uh, actually uh, we started the, the visa-free, so the only passport and also, and then the air ticket, you can go to Japan. So welcome to Japan. That's very special, sir, that you came to the PATA Summit to make that personal invitation. That's very special. Thank you very much. Florian, from your perspective, because Azerbaijan has always been brilliant in being very clear on your invitation, momentum in terms of putting it out there, bringing the world to Azerbaijan, and suddenly it all stopped, and the people of Azerbaijan really looked at you with a sense of, now I understand why you're so important. How do we make sure they never forget how important you are? Anita, <clears throat> let me first embrace um, how beautiful it is to be here in Ras al Khaimah, thanks to Pata, thanks to uh, Rocky, and to all colleagues who made that happen, because I think what we all forgot is how beautiful this most important um, element of tourism is, um, the soft power of uh, intercultural exchange, this power of uh, meeting in person and exchanging on different uh, point of views. In Azerbaijan, we have been um, strongly um, during the pandemic and uh, now in this uh, phase for a better future, looking on local, local resources, local people, what, what makes Azerbaijan genuine, what makes it unique, what makes it standing out by itself, by itself, without putting a lot of effort, except maybe working on the service quality, staging it, improving um, uh, infra or superstructure around some experiences. And I think that is the beauty we embraced during um, um, these past two years, domestic travel. None of us, and I think my colleagues from other tourism boards would agree, would ever uh, wanted to be engaged in uh, promoting domestic tourism. That's what we all uh, learned to do in um, early 2020 when people started to rediscover um, the beauty of their own uh, country. And um, me as an Austrian living and uh, working in Azerbaijan for 10 years, similar to uh, Rocky here, um, I found my home in Azerbaijan and I think uh, um, there is a lot of opportunities for us to go forward. The question is, Will the, will the future be um, implementing all sustainability, responsibility, what we were discussing during the past years? Uh, or will the future be, and as Liz mentioned, um, a revenge travel, um, looking back at um, um, over-tourism and um, similar phenomena we had uh, before? And I think this is a question to all of us. Indeed. And you raised a really important point as well about the issue of service culture and bringing that back, that putting, switching on the lights is one thing. Switching on the excitement and the lights in the eyes of the people who are serving the visitors, that's another one itself. Liz, I'm gonna ask you, because you have the challenge of, from a regional perspective, making sure that we never forget the impact of the industry as the surge of visitation now starts again. How do we do that? Well, I think for one, um, it, in terms of the impact of the industry, first of all, it was felt viscerally. And I think it's up to you, you know, the tourism leaders to keep reminding their colleagues you know, in trade, in finance, in economic development, you know, the impact of that. You know, there was a big vacuum. And so everyone from the big hotels to the, the you know, in Singapore, the hawker stalls, you know, organ, uh, Businesses that may not normally be defined as travel and tourism, everyone felt that knock-on effect. And I think it's also just, you know, demonstrating the return of what that can do. You know, we are a key employer across the region. And as I mentioned, you know, getting those b jobs back and honoring those people to welcome them back into the industry and create a positive, supportive work environment, I think, for me, that's also a sustainability topic. Absolutely. I'm not going to ask you, we've already had the cards. <laughs> we know how well you're doing it here. I'm going to ask you something that's a little bit of a twist, actually, in terms of, I always say that the fear is that as we get busy again and the world starts traveling again, our muscle memory is going to kick in and we're going to just go back to doing the way things we were before. 
What is the one habit you hope that your destination or your entity never falls back into again as we look to the future? Florian, if you look at how Azerbaijan was developing tourism in the past, or rather how tourism was developing in Azerbaijan, what's the one thing you think, ooh, I'm not doing that in the future? What we've really been learning um, um, doing since uh, the pandemic is a very strong bottom-up approach um, involving um, really um, every stakeholder um, in the most remote villages, looking and caring after them, um, after um, those who were really hit, who were really hit hardest, tour guides, um, uh, micro um, one woman, one man shows. Um, so, and engaging with them through this um, through this pandemic really made the concept of uh, of uh, developing tourism um, a different one by engaging um, um, most possible number of uh, of stakeholders into this process. It's a, it's a great point you mentioned because everyone realized how much they needed each other as a result of this. Honorable Secretary, what are you hoping? doesn't happen in India in tourism going forward? Well, well one is, uh, you know, one of the impact of the revenge tourism that we are seeing is the, the issue of carrying capacity coming up at various destinations. Because uh, especially what has happened is now with the, uh, you know, very good infrastructure that has taken place in India in the last few years, we're seeing large amount of travel from the metros to destinations nearby. And especially in the hilly regions of the country, and in certain you know, remote locations, we are seeing excessive travel happening. So I don't. I hope that dies out when, once the you know the the urge to travel goes down a little, and destinations are able to you know manage things in a way. There are already you know carrying capacity limitations happening at important hill stations in India, happening at important pilgrimage centres in India where large people, a number of people come. So I think that going forward, I would like to prevent the overcrowding at some very fragile destinations that we have. And you've actually raised a very good point because th the dam wall has broken and the water's pouring in now, but that doesn't mean that that's the level the water is going to continue to flow at once that pent up demand and that that, that ache to travel has gone past. It's, it's reading the signals are gonna be, is gonna be very, very important. Honorable Minister, from your point of view, please. Yes, yeah, um, I think Maldives will continue our march because the past has told us we were doing good. The, after the pandemic, we were crowned the world's leading destination in 2020 and also in 2021, world's leading destination. And we are hoping that we win it for a third time. But of course, we must fine tune. We will do that. We learn from small, small hiccups we had, but that overall the march has been good. The, we are celebrating our 50 years of tourism now. The main model of Maldives tourism is one island, one resort concept. So that one we will protect. It has got a lot of planning guidelines, uh, limitations. But also we want to cap uh, capture the imagination of the new investor. We want to capture the new future tourist. So we are giving development uh, openness so that creative minds of the investors can come and put products in the Maldives that will be leading again, that Lovely. will keep the Maldives as a lead destination. Also a very strong focus, we want to do it on uh, community-based tourism, especially we are focusing on making Maldives accessible. Maldives is a beautiful country and everybody, no matter his limitations or her limitations, they should come and experience Maldives. So we are going to uh, focus on a very strong market. Only thing is that we have to emphasize that we must rely on multiple markets and make sure that we have backup plans. Thank you. Absolutely. It's a very well said, stated point. And I'm delighted to welcome here to us here, coming in from Indonesia, joining us here in Wasal Kaima. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Dr. Sandiaga Salahuddin Uno, the Honorable Minister of Tourism and Creative Industries in Indonesia. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Good afternoon and warmest greeting to you all. Hi, Anita and Excellency Ministers. I am so happy to see you all again. 
Some of you see, uh, saw me in New York. Some of you came to Bali. So thank you very much for having me, Anita. Indeed, thank you very much, sir. We are thrilled you are with us because not only do you represent wonderful Indonesia, but you represent the G20 as well in terms of freshness of perspective. So thank you very much for joining us and making the time for us today. We're talking, sir, a little bit about what we've learned through this last two and a half years and things we want to stop doing when we go forward. So lessons we've learned and what do we want to make sure that we don't carry on from the past as we build into the future? I'd love to see here from you, sir, and we again, we get the benefit of 20 responses when we speak to you. When you came out of the G20 and you had all of the discussions about rebuilding the industry, we also celebrated World Tourism Day with you in Indonesia and in Bali. What was the main thinking, sir, around what we did in the past with tourism that we must stop doing going forward? Does anything come to mind? Well, you mentioned muscle memories, and I was an athlete when I was much younger. Uh, and muscle memories really taught you how you instantaneously uh, react when things go uh, according to plans or even into a new sort of like new settings, you tend to go back to the old ways of doing things. Here in Indonesia, we are moving away, thanks to pandemic, uh, from the quantity approach of calculating the economic impacts because behind the numbers of tourist arrivals, there are people. So we are focusing on jobs and livelihood of the people. We have to make sure post pandemic, the policies have to focus on how we could empower and create better quality jobs for uh, the uh, people and the stakeholders of the industry. Secondly, uh, it's focusing on sustainability. Some of the things like buffet, breakfast. You see so many foods being wasted. And thanks to the pandemic, we're not allowed to serve buffet anymore because of obviously health reasons. And I think those were the ones, and I'm seeing now hotels starting to go back and serve buffet, uh, which is uh, actually responsible for a lot of the food loss and food waste which actually, um, and we calculated here, contribute to more than two times the weight of yourself within a particular year. I'm uh, about uh, 71 kilograms, and according to the average, I'm wasting close to 150 kilograms of food per year. So this is something that we need to change post the pandemic. And fourth uh, is what we want to focus on how we handle the environmental sustainability in terms of use of water, the use of new and renewable energy, like how we fix Bali and thanks to G20, we're going to put a limit on non-electric vehicle operating within the main venues. So those are the things, and I could list 20 more, including the cleanliness, health, safety uh, considerations. But I think uh, this is something that the pandemic has given lessons at the use of digitalizations and how we could, I really prefer to be in person at Ras Al Qaima, but uh, I could not for uh, some of the uh, meetings I have to attend today, but. I still, uh, I'm still able to at least say hi to some of you, and that's also through digitalization. So this is something that we need to work uh, effectively and efficiently going forward so the recovery will be a better recovery. 
Brilliant. Thank you very much. And as much as we only have you from technically the neck up in, in Rosselheim, we have you here in spirit. So thank you very much. I want thank to go you. on to the first priority that you spoke about and actually ask you, Rocky, about this. And I'm going to pick it up with you, Liz, because you've been a real advocate about this in making sure that we protect people's jobs and bring them back into the industry itself. I'd love to understand what was the approach taken here in terms of making sure that the industry protected those workers and those workers knew that they were safe. Because if you looked around the world, many other places just watch doors shut and jobs come to an end. So when the pandemic hit, obviously none of us knew. I, I thought it was going to be a couple of weeks, uh, you know, so we were, we were getting ready. But when we launched our stimulus package on April 1st, the focus was for the non-government hotels and the number one priority was to make sure doors stayed open. And, and employees kept their jobs. We also waived any fines, any fees that we did, and what we did for the first year uh, uh, leading into 2021, uh, we gave back 20% of the tax that the, that the hotels collected for them to keep with them. And this was just a way that us as an emirate wanted to give back to the industry and the community in order to ensure they do that. We have, a, we have a campaign that we launched called RACFAM, and basically it is focused on the uh, 6,000 employees that we have working in the tourism industry. Everything from improving their livability, making sure there's transportation that goes to where their accommodation is, and a, and a new initiative that we're launching next year is we're helping each one of these employees achieve their dreams based on longevity in the destination. So if, if the purpose of them coming to Ras Al Khaimah is to, um, uh, build a home, uh, a house back in their homeland, or open a supermarket or a business or whatever it is, um, we as, a, as an emirate and as a destination will support them as long as they stay living in the emirate and continue from a longevity perspective. Well, that's lovely to hear. And Liz, from your perspective, because again, you've been a real advocate of this, of making sure that we bring people back in, we protect their jobs. From Pata's perspective, how do you feel we can now start focusing on making sure that that indeed is delivered? Um, well, what's interesting is that I'll, I'll share a personal experience I had when I was on holiday. And the property, you know, the staff didn't know that I'm in this role. And um, it was really the best practice because I had, and it was in Thailand, Koh Samoy, and the staff were warm and accommodating. And actually, at that same time, you know, we were watching some challenging news out of Europe with lost luggage. They had more than enough staff at this property. And when I talked to the staff, I said, you know, I asked them about their experience. And they said, the owners and the GM took such good care of us. We were treated like family. And, you know, some people, you know, maybe they lost a 20% of their staff, but the rest, they were able to hang on and take care of them. And they said things like, oh, they let us stay in the villas when they were empty and shut down. They let us, they had us like give each other, like the, it was a wellness retreat. They had each other, they were giving each other the experience of a customer. And so that time was used and not everyone could do that, but I think, you know, the loyalty and the, the care that they felt. And I think that, you know, if, if more properties could extend that feeling to their staff of, you know, really treasuring them, yes. I think that's important because they are. You can't, there's only so much you can do to change traveler behavior, but you should advocate. I know one of the, the hotel properties, you know, they, their mantra is um, the hotel chains, ladies and gentlemen serving ladies and gentlemen. We shouldn't expect good behavior you know, zero tolerance for abuse of our staff. We should expect zero uh, tolerance for abuse by management, you know, if a, a bad employee or a manager. And so let's protect this, the staff as, you know, a critical asset and, and make them feel a part of a family and a community. Absolutely. It's a really good point. And exactly that point about confidence and confidence of having a job. So ladies and gentlemen, we have s almost a little bit seven minutes left, shall we say. I have seven lovely distinguished speakers. I'm going to give you the chance to each get two more answers in for questions. It means 30 seconds each. So 30 second challenges to all of you. Please complete this line. And we're going to start with you, Rocky. I, because ultimately, people's confidence in investing in a destination and returning is going to come from your confidence. Rocky Phillips, you have confidence in the future of tourism in Ross Kema because, 30 seconds. 
Because Ras al-Khaimah offers something that isn't available in a lot of places. One, from a nature perspective, the highest mountain, 64 kilometers of ocean front, and a desert. But we also are a progressive emirate. The recent announcement of, of WIN has been a game changer, uh, pun. To, <laughs> pun intended, to, to, to the industry. You, uh, the, the emirate is going through an unbelievable transformation where in the next five years, this will be like no other destination in the world. Brilliant. Dr. Uno, 30 seconds. You have confidence in Indonesia and the future of tourism because? Because we're together, Anita. Because we are collaborating. Because we're not fighting for quantities. Because we are united in this hospitality, travel, and tourism industry. Because we care of each other. Because we put forward people before numbers because we believe that the recovery is not just recover stronger, recover together, but also recover better. Brilliant. If we look at Hoshino-san, you have confidence in the future of Japan because, 30 seconds. Okay, because we are pursuing, I mean, the, through the tourism, and then uh, let the, uh, the, the keep the both travelers and then the, also the resident, local resident, uh, have to be satisfied. So Brilliant. That's our confidence. Thank you very much. Florian, 30 seconds. You have confidence in the future of tourism in Azerbaijan because? Because of its uh, unlimited number of uh, tangible and intangible resources, but most importantly of uh, uh, its people, because of its people. And um, this is why we'll make tourism um, next to um, oil and gas uh, an important contribution to the economic, socioeconomic development of Azerbaijan. Brilliant. Honorable Minister of Tourism of Maldives, 30 seconds. You yeah, have thank confidence you. because... The Maldives is beauty, beautiful, very, very beautiful. And we are united. Everybody is working together. Maldives has got international presence. All the brands are there. And of course, there is the one nobody could copy, Maldivian hospitality, the people. And we are really investing on people. And with that, an inclusive approach, I'm sure the road ahead is very bright for the Maldives. Brilliant. Honorable Secretary of Tourism, 30 seconds. Uh, number one, our domestic travel is booming, and uh, all our destinations are full with domestic tourists. That shows that, you know, we are ready, and we are open, and we are a very safe destination. Number two, India, you know, has a lot to offer. The culture, the heritage, the food, the snow-capped mountains, deserts, beaches. It has all that you cannot find in one country. You'll have to travel a continent to try, you know, gain the experiences that you gain in India. That's why I have uh, hope in India. And number three, we take over from Indonesia, the presidency of G20 <laughs> on the 1st of December. And, uh, you know, for the next one year, there will Good be... Good answer. <laughs> <laughs> there will be 215 plus meetings at 55 locations in India. And on the sidelines, we'll be doing a large number of events, including an investors conference, a global mice meet, and a whole series of meetings. So the investors conference, for those interested in you know, investing in the hospitality sector, is in January, February. So I'm confident that all this will lead to a surge in international and domestic tourism in India. Sir, didn't you just say three hours ago that there weren't enough meetings taking place in India? I think that's about to change. Liz, 30 seconds. You have confidence in tourism regaining and re-strengthening in Asia because... I would say never before has this re development of responsible travel and tourism been embraced by so many factions in the industry and the consumers. So everyone from you know, these esteemed government leaders and those in the room to hotel investors, hotel owners, SMEs, multinationals, you know, are requiring it. Um, in, in corporate travel, you can't get a contract unless you're embracing ESG roles. So, you know, every corner of the, 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 the ecosystem is embracing responsible travel. And so I think that gives me hope and confidence. Brilliant. So, Dr. Uno, I'm going to give you the challenge to start for everyone else. Ten seconds. Ten second challenge. You are going to make a commitment to the Pata community. What is your commitment in less than three words? Ten seconds. Quality, sustainability, nature and culture, and also sun, sea and sun, plus serenity, spirituality and sustainability. <laughs> Brilliant. <laughs> Rocky, 10 seconds, three words. 
that's, that's a hard act to follow, but I would say um, uh, innovation, change, and an amazing time. Ooh, good response. Honorable Minister. Thank you, Anita. Together we can. Thank you. Oh, well done, Honorable Secretary. I would say a warm welcome to visit India and do events during our presidency of the G20. Brilliant. Florian. To be a professional partner and um, uh, contribute to, to the joint uh, success in uh, developing further the entire region. Excellent. Yeah, uh, maybe the hospitality and the tourism services. Yeah, that, that's the, uh, the, the promising. Yeah, that, that's, that's all promising. Yeah. Thank you. Liz. From Pata, community, insights, collaboration. Excellent. Ladies and gentlemen, 15 seconds on the clock. Please join me in thanking our great panel. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much again, delegates. Thank you. Thank you, Anita. Okay, everybody. First of all, I would like to thank Your Highness, Excellencies, delegates, ladies and gentlemen, thank you again for attending this first part of our session today. Right now, we will break for a little bit of coffee and snacks over here. We have about 20 minutes, but Please, let's come back here by 4.15 for the next half of our session. Thank you again, and we'll see you again later.